Hello, everyone. It's Brent with Brent. Again, I'm so pleased to be joined by Jason Spizak. How are you? I am fantastic. That was the world's shortest intro. I was expecting you to go on and be like, and the man, the myth, the legend, and uh, you may have heard him on some TV shows and video games. And I was just kind of glad you didn't do any of that because it's always weird and embarrassing to hear what you've done before like you talk. And it's kind of weird. I find it way more fun to have you do that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've done nothing. Go to imdb.com. There it is. I just, uh, whatever tickles your fancy. We should give uh, those listeners who might not know you a little bit of a background. Uh, of course, we will dive into some of that during our conversation, so I won't give too much. But uh... <laughs> What do you mean they don't know me? How could they not know me? I'm so offended. I said I'm leaving this conversation right now. So if, if anyone has picked up yet, um, Jason may be a professional voice actor, <laughs> would you say? <laughs> you know, what's so funny is I have a T-shirt that says that I may be a professional voice actor someday. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I mean, I started out doing Linux. I mean, even be almost at the same time I started out doing voiceover, but voiceover professionally for 22 years. And my first experience with Linux was in 1997. So they're, they're just, I think they are exactly about the same time, pretty much. Well, that's amazing that you kind of fell into two great things all at once and that they're still with you. Like 20 years is not a short period of time, right? Yeah. Because I couldn't get any jobs in voiceover when I started. Yeah. That's why. And then I was like, I need something to do to make me busy. Oh, Linux. Hey, that's really hard. And so give us a little bit of background of, of that Linux stuff, because you've you've been involved in a few projects. And uh, what were those like? What were they? Yeah, I think you mean to say a few failures. I very first got involved with Joseph Cheek. He was the, the guy who founded Redmond Linux. And this was about the time that Windows XP had come out. And Linux had a GUI, had had X windows and uh, KDE 1.2 or something around that time. And Caldera Linux was still around. And Joseph had worked for Microsoft for a little while as a tester and then had worked for Caldera um, for a while and then decided he wanted to do his own Linux distribution. And I saw it on the internets and was like, that's cool. It's going to look like Windows and try to get Windows users away from Windows. And it's going to mimic XP. It's going to have like a my computer and that whole thing so that they will be uh, sweet talked away and be using Linux. Uh, wow, was I young and naive. Whew, boy, <laughs> just saying that out loud. Uh you know what, Daddy? We're going to build our own operating system, and it's going to be better than Windows, and they're going to just use ours instead. I don't care if there's no software. It's just better. <laughs> so Joseph and I, you know, I was co-founder, I guess, of Redmond Linux. Uh, he was the coder, and I did a bunch of the icons, uh, graphic design, and a bunch of user interface suggestions for him, and some sales advice. The name of Redmond Linux, we changed to Lycoris Linux, which was probably my singular most, singularly largest marketing failure of my entire life. Uh, Lycoris is a flower, L-Y-C-O-R-I-S. And <laughs> what an odd name for a product. It was about that time Lindos was coming out. Lindos was a basically a, a Linux distribution that was one letter different than Windows just because the guy who started it wanted to get sued. And, <laughs> and did. <laughs> yeah, and, and did. And it was on the Walmart $199 PC. And so we changed our name to like Chorus just so we could be a little, so not get sued. Like maybe that was part of it, I think, at the time and uh, changed our branding a little bit. So we thought it would be much cooler. Because you felt like Redmond was a bit like... On the nose? A bit challenging like it was it was looking for some problems basically yeah or difficult to spell because apparently lycoris is so easy to spell i really don't know what we were thinking i have no <laughs> clue it had less letters i got i got no clue uh and we wanted to get on the walmart 199 dollars pc too as well i actually went to see a guy named rich who was in charge of the uh OEM that was making the Walmart $199 PC at the time. Uh, he was in California. And I went there and basically tried to get him to put us on the machine too, because Lindos was selling in, at Walmart, walmart.com, and we were not. And we're like, come on, we could do this. We could get there too. Uh, 
they gave us one dollar per license to put light chorus on those pcs wow and uh we got i thought it was it's an okay deal it's an okay deal we got this we're gonna be on walmart.com we're gonna be fine and it's like i was such an idiot it's slightly more than zero yeah it's only slightly more than zero we were hand printing the license cards because joseph (laughs) had the idea that licensing linux was the way to make revenue and while i didn't necessarily wholeheartedly agree i was like i don't really have another idea so we did And we hand printed cards on cardstock, license cards, and then printed out labels as license keys because he came from Microsoft where it was all about license keys and everything. And I didn't really love that part of it, but I thought, well, what else am I going to charge Rich for? I mean, what do I tell him? If there's no license key in the box, how do I charge for this operating system? And we couldn't really come up with another way. And that was the way that Rich and everybody else who was an OEM for Microsoft knew and understood how things go. License keys. I mean, they, they got it, right? Well, I have a question about that, though, like, because that was based on, on Linux. Does that conflict with the open source license then? No, because we had the source code available for download all the time, anytime. I see. So you can license the actual product, but still have the, huh, interesting. And the license was the license key for your install of like Chorus Linux with the icons and the rest. I mean, kind of like RHEL does it now, right? Where they charge you for their icons and their, um, their brand and access to certain repositories and things like that. So yeah, that was back in, I think 2001 was the time we made that deal. And we were like, yeah, they could download it for free. I think we also let people download the OS for free to test it and everything, just just the way it was. We all we what we didn't want was people just reproducing the CD on, you know, linuxcd.com and, you know, we 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 did worry about that, but only from a branding perspective that if you don't protect your trademark, you lose it and then what do you have, right? So Again, this is a bit of an antiquated way of thinking. I'm not saying I think this way now, of course, but I'm trying to get into the mindset of the decisions we were making at the time. And it was the wrong way to do it. And it didn't succeed, really. I mean, we sold, I don't know, like a couple hundred licenses. You made a couple hundred bucks. Woo! And how many hours does this take you to build these, you know, RPMs and everything? Uh, And eventually, you know, they that operating system went by the wayside. I mean, there's just no way to maintain it and... uh, build a company off of that kind of business model didn't work uh then i monkeyed around with a tablet pc os for a little while and then uh got involved on the side with symphony os because i had done this thing called the mezzo desktop m-e-z-z-o and it was the idea that the four corners of the desktop were hot corners and you could go into them and you'd get your files in one corner, your apps in another corner, your, and this is long before Gnome Shell had the thing where you could go up to the corner to get your activities. And this is years before that. Yeah. I mean, you see that today in KDE, like I use that every once in a while and I, on Mac OS, actually, I used to use it all the time, right? Well, you're welcome. (laughs) Thank you. And that, but that's the interesting thing about Linux that I've noticed in the last, you know, X number of decades is that often some of these ideas come to Linux first and then they kind of get ripped off from there, right? It wasn't a new idea. When I went through the treatise of the Mezzo desktop and the principles of desktop usability, I was riffing off of other people's uh, white papers or academia about what the usefulness areas of the desktop are. But I was putting them into practice with a user interface that was this eventually rolled into Symphony OS because it was like a web-based OS prior to Chrome OS. You know, it was this web-based OS. Symphony OS was. You're just arriving way too early, that's all. <laughs> yes, I appreciate your um, verbiage. So we, we, we were building that out of, I can't remember what toolkit that Symphony OS was built out of, but on my own machine, I had built a precursor to Chrome OS, which launched all of the web apps that Google had at the time, Google Calendar and everything, using FVWM2. So it kind of works like Chrome OS did before they went with the central dock icon bar when it looked a little bit more like Windows when the Chrome OS icons were at the bottom. I was doing that years before Chrome OS came out. I have screenshots of it and everything where I had an OS because I was like, everything should be web-based. In like the in 2001 or two, I built a web app out of Zope, which was a Python based database to run a recruiter, um, like a technical recruiting firm like Dice.com. I, I built it, which became Plone, but it's Zope uh, at the time. 
And I built, it was an, basically an entire web application and it ran off of a Red Hat 5.2, not RHEL 5.2, but Red Hat 5.2 server. And it was using terminal servers to all get to that box. And then that they, it was just using a web browser. And at the time that was just like unheard of. I mean, I think Sun was doing their, their Java thin client at the time, you know, and real, real apps, not web apps. So I was just really early on the, hey, web apps are going to be huge curve. Um, and I, so that's the kind of work I did on that and ended up getting rolled into Symphony OS. And that was also a huge failure. And then I got really busy in voiceover and kind of, you know, just use Linux on my own machines forever and have used KDE since one, uh, I think it was 1.2 um, with the Copeland icons. Tell me the Coles Notes version of how you ever got to Linux in the first place. Like, obviously you have this deep appreciation for it and, and desire to forward it, but where did that ever come from? I always loved to build things. Like I was hugely into Legos when I was a kid. And I always loved to just create things, very much a builder. And when I came in contact with Linux for the first time, it was a Red Hat CD in either the back of a book or a magazine. I can't remember. It wasn't Linux format because it wasn't around then, but like that. And I might have been Linux Journal. It's possible. And I was like, what is this? It looks like Windows. I think it was on the magazine at the time. or I can't remember. That might have been right. It might have been before that. I swear it would have been a book. Anyway, and I, I'm like, well, this is interesting. What's this about? And so I had a PC at the time that I had built myself to play Mech Warrior. That's the only reason you build PCs. Let's be perfectly honest. <laughs> you need some motivation, right? Had it hooked up to my sound blaster and my my giant 32 inch tube television, you know, and uh, I would play it in my living room and it would shake the neighbors. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and so I popped the CD in. I think at the Yes, it was a CD at the time. I had to have a boot floppy, but it was a CD at the time. And I was just so, so enamored with the fact that there could be something else as an operating system that wasn't Windows. I love that feeling. It opened up a passageway in my brain that went, oh, you haven't been walking on the sidewalk. You've been walking on the platform above the sidewalk. You are an idiot. <laughs> And it, it really opened my eyes as to, as opposed to just building the hardware with my hands, which is, you know, one layer of building, that the idea that the operating system and software was a, a its own universe inside this machine doing its thing. And there would became the idea that this universe could be free and open. And shortly after that, I was really interested in what, Linux was, that it came out of Minix and that it was Linus Torvald's like side project that he decided to build. And I'm reading this and I'm like, and then what happened? He gave the code out on the internets and people all worked together to, what? Which is so completely the opposite of the paradigm at the time. Completely opposite. And it, it blew me away because it was the beginning of what I now call digital independence. It was the beginning of the idea for me, obviously, open source start software with the GNU uh, Foundation and everything. It didn't start with Linux per se, but it was my first experience with the idea that you have all the source code. You're not beholden to a corporate entity to run your computer, to license the software. And if you make a change and you improve the software, if you have an idea it can be contributed back to the greater whole for everybody. So to me, it was a micro example of human knowledge. Patents are not, they're not what happens to human knowledge. For millennia, you know, thousands of centuries, when a human gets an idea, he shares it with another human and then she shares it with somebody else and then she gives it, tells it to her kids and then he shares it to his kids and then you basically have the volume of human knowledge accelerated our ability to uh, enforce our will upon nature at such a pace because of the interconnections and sharing. That's why we are the dominant species on the planet, not just luck, but our ability to communicate and share ideas and then share knowledge because of that allows us to get, solve problems that there's just no way you could solve them if your, your knowledge died with the last person that knew a certain thing. Uh, 
you know, fast forward centuries into the future and here we are. So that's why Linux has such a snowball rolling downhill effect when it comes to uh, software for computer and then the, mic the ecosystem around it is because it's basically a representation of what happens with human knowledge without any restrictions. If you don't have patents and if you don't have arbitrary lines between, you know, boundaries between countries or whatever, you know, we share ideas with each other. And just to make the sum total of that knowledge better for everyone. Well, that's why it works. That's why it works. And that bit me in the leg. I'm like, okay, this is awesome. So it's the embodiment of what human knowledge and sharing is normally in software, which part of this point hadn't been. And it, it, it was digital freedom or what I call digital independence. And that's huge because I could see the future developing around me that the internet would soon be everything. Fax machines were just on their way out. And I was like, okay, if everything happens inside the computer and on wires that connect us, he who controls the wires in the computer controls everything and will control the knowledge of the world. So we can't let that be a company, especially not Microsoft. They were awful, awful and from a business practice perspective, not just a convicted monopolist, but good night. They were just so rude, just so rude. <laughs> and... That's what kept me coming back after failure, after failure, after failure was it's incumbent upon me as a member of the human society to get this into the hands of as many humans as possible because armed with this, we can be bolstered against a future of oligarchy and digital oppression. We, it's the only weapon we're going to have. And I just knew early on that if, if I could contribute to that in some way, my children and their children would have the silent weaponry with which to arm themselves to to win that battle against digital oppression. And everything else is tangential to that. So. Did you feel at the time when you you were first coming to these ideas that there were people around you that felt the same? Or did you feel kind of alone in those ideas? Yeah, I felt alone. I didn't go to lugs a lot. The reason was because I always just was on the internet and connected with somebody else uh, like Joseph or whoever I was working with on a project at the time, there was always someone like-minded out there on the internet. I mean, you know, <laughs> everybody's connected to it. So that's what it's for. <laughs> right. That's, what, that's his job. So it was not hard for me to find like-minded people and, and then work with them. Like within minutes of meeting them. I'm like, here's what we need to do. We need to have a web-based OS. So, and I'm like, okay, slow down, Jay. <laughs> but it sounds like some of those ideas were sort of visionary. And so it sounds like... I don't know if I'd go that far. Maybe that's over generous, but we'll, we'll use it. I mean, that icons on the Linux desktop need to be pretty. Yeah. Maybe I was like one of the earlier guys to, to figure that out. <laughs> but also a necessary thing to adopt, you know, for the greater population. You know, it's just making things simpler and... Yeah. But to me, that seems so obvious that perhaps, you know, I wouldn't call it visionary. I would just say, these are the pieces in front of us. And maybe I'm not good at creating pieces, but connecting the pieces, I'm pretty good at that, seeing those type of pathways. I just think the human brain is really good at doing that anyway, but I could just kind of see where things were going. And, uh, you know, but I think a lot of people see where they're going and they don't do anything about it. It's not that this is a major leap in any way. It's just the follow on of a conclusion. There's a lot of science fiction writers who knew it way before I knew it. I mean, they probably knew it before I even saw the things in front of me, you know, but uh, the idea that you would then be spurred to action, which is one of the things that makes the open source community so great is like Home Assistant, for example, or even WireGuard. These are modern examples of, and Linux has this nomenclature of getting scratching an itch, right? That the developer is like, I don't want to use Alexa. I don't want to have Google in my house, uh, Amazon, Google, whoever. And I just, you know, going to build this thing so that my gadgets can talk to each other and I can live a modern, you know, um, would you like me to do that for you, Mr. Stock? Like everybody wants that. So let's, I want that. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, but how quickly it can become useful it is because everybody else shares and it, it's like actionable. Code is actionable. Well, one thing about, you know, you mentioned Home Assistant. Uh, 
Well, you mentioned two things. You mentioned Home Assistant and WireGuard. So I just um, dove into my first WireGuard project this week, actually. And it has gone so amazingly well that I was like, oh, everybody needs this. Why? You know, like even the commercial platforms are like far worse. <laughs> so it's like, what, what a gift, right? It's crazy. I, I did not, until I heard it on your show, I had never heard about it until I heard it on Linux Unplugged. And uh, it changed my life. I was helping my dad putting up some home assistant stuff in his place. And I went like, you know, he's like, how am I going to know if the door is open when I'm not home, you know, or something. And I said, well, I could give you access to this interface and it can pop up notifications on your phone and all this cool stuff. But that means that I have to open your house up to the internet, dun, dun, dun. you know, like, and there was this thing, well, then that means we need a VPN or that means whatever, we need to get an SSL certificate. And even then, you know, it's going to be attacked from the outside world because that port is open. And then I just stopped for a second and I went, Linux Unplugged told me about this thing called WireGuard. Excuse me for one second. <laughs> and like 30 minutes less than that later, I'm on my cell phone on LTE connecting that app to the home assistant server that you can't get to any other way unless I have it on my phone. Isn't that incredible? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? Are you joking, people? <laughs> it's so unbelievable. Oh, your gosh. See, and that's what I find important is like, you're still giddy like that first moment you discovered Linux, right? It's like, it just continues. It's just such a beautiful thing. Every time. It's like a, a present that's on a day that's not my birthday. Every time. <laughs> and, and then in the back of my head, when I say that, having been a developer of like a project that's trying to make money or to, in order to stay afloat, not make money to line your pockets, but to make money so that the project can continue. How difficult that is in a world where uh, the capitalist ideals are so prevalent um, with patents and neoliberalism, capitalism, not having anything to do with the political um, liberalism, but having to do with the guys that are around in the 70s who were like, free market economies are everything, neoliberal economics, uh, that we find, we struggle to find a reason to pay for something that's free or struggle as people who provide open source code to say, this is how much this is worth. And there's a social contract here that you use this and your dad can access his house now, but did you PayPal the WireGuard guy? Did you sign up to his Patreon? Did you what? And that's why I really appreciate what uh, Daniel and friends are doing at elementary, trying to put a store in the OS that says, would you like to pay for this? Because it's an option and make it super, super easy not to guilt people into doing it, which is the wrong methodology, but to say it's worth something to me and for you to have the ability to say that it's worth something to me. And the internet tip jar, you know, software, there's a bunch of them out there, but nobody's quite gotten it to the point where it's pennies, it's 25 cents, it's whatever from a billion people and I can do my job. Uh, credit card companies still stand in the way of that a lot because of the fees for transactions. Of course. But once we get there, that gateway is one of the things that open source needs because I don't think anybody wants to go to work. I don't think any software developer really, unless they really love their job, wants to deal with a boss that is like, yeah, your open source project is cool, but this, I need you to do this now because of my company that you may not agree with its mission completely because you're not saving the world, but it pays your bills. And I think it would be lovely to have these super talented people not have to have this be their side hustle because I think that, and, and maybe that's not true. It's possible that some people love their side hustle so much because they hate their job. Um, I'm an actor. And so I understand human nature uh, really, really pretty darn well. And it's possible that if you turn this, once you turn open source projects into someone's job, it loses the magic for them. The same way as if your hobby became your small business, that doesn't work for everybody. And it could be a gift to the open source community that these things are people's side hustles. Not going to overlook that. But it would be nice to make sure that people who put their time and effort into something are compensated. Because when you work really hard and you deal with open source communities, they can be 
a little unruly and a little demanding. Just ask Manjaro, you know, <laughs> what do you mean we're going to put in a different office suite? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and you're like, but you're my community. Well, they care. That's why they're being so difficult to handle and, and work with. Um, it would be nice to know that remuneration is available. It would be very nice. And, and, and that's why I feel like the elementary project is pushing the envelope in the right direction in that they're not forcing anyone. They're just providing an option that's very easy. Just make the title bars like windows. I think you'll be okay. <laughs> so to, to bring it back a little bit, because I did, I took you on a little bit of a sidebar there. Um, tell me a little bit then about how you brought all of that um, into a simple PC. Because that's a bit of a different project from the others. I didn't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> yeah, totally different. Just... <laughs> uh, yeah. There was a person who lived across the street, or their office was across the street from a place that I had an office. And she, her name is Barbara. She's an amazing person. And she had taken over a PC recycling company that would take people's old PCs and recycle them. It, either part them out or sell the parts on... Uh, eBay or um, there's a, com a couple of vendor type online sites that also sell to um, Windows integrators where they need a piece for a PC and they need to replace that because they can't just buy a new PC because the software on it <laughs> won't run on the most recent OS. And so they like to make sure they keep older PCs running with parts, you know, so there's, there's a market for that. And she had taken it over from her son who took off, way, bit off way more than he could chew. And I just went in there one day and I was looking around and I'm like, you have shelves upon shelves of old computer parts. First of all, as a guy who used to build computers, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as, as a guy who you know, has a, a bit of a business mind, albeit obviously a failed one, I thought, this, is, this could be a business model. Why don't we just create a case that's universal because a lot of these things are not MATX. They're not, they're, you know, they're specialty type motherboards. Or Why don't we make something where we've got blocks where the screws might go because they might be in slightly different places depending upon the motherboard pattern. And we make it so that it could fit any one of these size motherboards from any one of these things. And we, I just went around with a measuring tape and I got what the largest size would need to be so it could accommodate anything from that down lower. And then designed the power supply, the space for the power supply, and then they made it out of recycled plastic because I really wanted to do the right thing for the environment because keeping PC parts out of landfills or anywhere is the only way that we're going to be able to live in a, on a healthy planet because we keep generating e-waste nonstop. And the more lives you can give a CPU, the more lives you can give a motherboard, you know, nine lives, you're, you're doing the right thing for your, your children's children and those you love. So I took a, this design and I made it out of recycled plastic. I actually have a prototype built out of cardboard. Very cool pictures. <laughs> I'm sure if I, <laughs> I can find them, maybe I'll send them to you. And I uh, did some of the thermal... Uh, like thermal dynamics in the case to make sure that it could pull enough air through the front to shoot it out the back and that this thing wouldn't boil. And, you know, because uh, plastic is notoriously uh, heat cloistering, meaning it doesn't really like to let the heat out. It's a, it's slow. If you build the whole thing out of aluminum, it'll radiate the heat out. But this is a all plastic case with no metal to transmit the heat anywhere. So I was like, okay, I'll take this, see if I can get this idea going. And then we need the business piece. So what if you could keep this PC for a year and have a year warranty? So if it breaks down any time during the year, you send us back the whole computer and we send you out a whole new one. We're not responsible for your data. The disclaimer on the warranty is back your stuff up because you're sending us the whole thing and we're just giving, doing full-on replacement. And then we can always take it apart, take the parts that work and put them into a new one. Well, so it's recycled parts to begin with. So there's no difference there. And you just continue that cycle, right? It's like recycle, recycle, recycle. Yeah. And you just continue that cycle literally forever and ever and ever and ever. And you only take out the parts that don't work. Correct. Right. And if the case is fine, we just reuse the case. And... After the one-year warranty is up, 
you can still send it back to us to get a discount of X dollars towards your new one. So it's always good for a turn-in. It's always good for an exchange, basically. Because I'm figuring these cases, I probably won't change the look of these cases because motherboards are fairly standard. They don't change dramatically in shape too often, you know. There's a, and uh, we'll just use, we'll just get the parts that will fit. And, and that's a pretty good business model. And we'll charge 99 bucks because there's just enough money in 99 bucks for me to make money off of these units after the assembly, after everything else. We'll still make them pay for shipping because they could ask for one on the other side of the country and like the margin's so thin, forget it. Um, and put regular Ubuntu on this because Ubuntu itself, there's plenty of support out there in the world through forums and everything else that we will not offer software support because the hardware is so cheap. You just get that from the community. And out of that money, we will give a percentage of it divided up to all the open source projects that went into making the simple PC. So we would give money to Ubuntu. We would give money to Debian. We would give money, a portion of that to, uh, there's a foundation under which LibreOffice and a bunch of others can take uh, disbursement. That's where they get some of their funds. I think LibreOffice is on its own, but there's another umbrella foundation that multiple projects fall under. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a, a nonprofit. And we're making that donation on, be, on their behalf, on the user's behalf, right? So I don't have to depend on the user to start up elementary or whatever it is and then take money out of their wallet. I'm making that when they buy. That's at least something. It's not the continual source of revenue that people need in order to live, but it's something. And we make that donation as a business. That's a charitable donation. In most instances, it's actually a tax write-off. So this is works, works for everybody. It's great. The Raspberry Pi I saw coming out at that time. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was like, everybody was asking, like, can your PC have wireless? And I'm like, well, you can plug a USB wireless in the back. These are old PCs. They're like Pentiums, you know. And I'm like, they're not nearly as energy efficient as a Raspberry Pi. It's, it's, the Raspberry Pi is going to have built-in wireless coming around the corner. Okay. This doesn't make any sense. So I did simple for... and. A while, one of my biggest markets I was trying to push is for like computer classrooms and places where they need the PCs to all look nice instead of just getting crappy recycled PCs. And then they get that back end support and that warranty so they feel good about it. That never really took off. Um, and maybe because Microsoft and Dell are dumping free PCs on schools. I don't know. So I didn't have those big buyer numbers. And I also saw the Raspberry Pi coming around the corner and thought this takes way less wattage. It's going to be wireless. It's going to be as fast as this thing is soon. <laughs> you know, because these are old computers, although not technically, you know, because an Intel Pentium can crush things a lot quicker. And everything. But it's, it's, you know, it's the trade-offs. So I decided to shut it off, shut Simple down. We honored anybody who sent us a warranty machine and nobody really did, actually. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a nice one. I know. That one, one person sent us a warranty machine the whole time uh, because they used to make PCs better. And that was it. So I haven't give up, given up loving on Linux or starting a business doing Linux. It's just I've never really made any of them self-sustaining, which to me is would be the goal. And every time it doesn't work out, I think to myself, maybe... It's the way I'm approaching this. Maybe I'm still too stuck in the neoliberalist mindset and a capitalist mindset. Maybe there's another human knowledge, aggregate community way to do this. And anytime I see something like the Pine 64 guys who are like, this phone's not perfect, but here, let's make it the best phone it can be. Or, hey, this laptop, it's not perfect. I'm not Dell. It's inexpensive. Let's make this what it, the best it can be. Um, I get heartened by that because I think it's somewhere close to that, uh, that, that it may find its legs or it may never. And the only place that Linux can really work out well is if you build your own stuff and buy recycled stuff and that's its super sweet spot. What's wrong with that? Right. Um, and to be fair, system 76, which ships great stuff, they're going to start making their own, you know, laptop cases and they're going to start moving away from ODM uh, boxes they did with Thelio. Uh, and maybe there is a room for an Apple-like Linux company that makes its own OS. I don't know. It just seems like there's a lot of expense there. But 
they're saved a lot of expense because they don't have to build EOS. You know, there's a lot of it they don't have to do. Yeah, and it and it fits for some people, right? But there's so many of these ideas that you've shared that that hit me in a really deep place because they're ideas that I've thought of for a really long time. You know, like I'm talking to you right now on an X220 and the only reason I'm on an X220 is because it's a wonderful computer from like eons ago if you look at, you know, some of the modern uh, stuff coming out, but I mean, imagine how cool it would be to take the guts of that X220 out and just put a new screen in it. That's you know an IPS display, real nice. And well, you know what's interesting is I, <laughs> Alex from Self Hosted, uh, he just helped me take an X250 and replace the screen in it with an IPS uh, that's 1080p and uh, replace the keyboard and stuff like this. So, you know, that's the beauty of some of these. Um, the computers with some of the old mindset of like um, being well built. You mean not the throwaway mindset? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. And and also being modular. Uh, I feel like that if we can, you know, if we can continue back to that place and have these laptops just continuously perpetuate, um, what a beautiful thing. And like, okay, maybe it doesn't fit for me anymore because the photos that I produce in my photography camera can't deal with this laptop but there is like about you know 70 percent of the population who's doing computing and they're just browsing the web and looking at email and stuff and this x220 well that's where the chromebook stole your thunder because the chromebook well <laughs> was literally that that's the market share and it's sliding into enterprise a little bit now which is interesting to see uh but after microsoft was just like well we'll give up we just like the cloud but it it feels like the, the Chromebook is the perfect Linux laptop, at least it is for me, because I just, um, I don't know, a week ago, I gave Matt, who is the Mr. Chromebox, the gentleman who makes the firmware, the core boot firmware for Chromebooks, I sent him a new Chromebook so that he could put the firmware on there and then get a few models checked off the list. I run a Chromebook with a core boot, you know, from Matt's firmware, and uh, that's Mr. Chromebox, if you're listening and you want to run a great laptop for inexpensive and a lot of the firm, like but my particular laptop, there are no issues with suspend, resume, sound, literally nothing. He works pretty tightly with the Gallium project, I think, that, to get Gallium on there. But I just run KDE Neon and I don't have any trouble. This thing is three years old. It is humming right along. It's got a 15 inch IPS display. I love it to death. My eyes aren't good enough for the high def displays anymore. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what do you mean? No, I can totally see that. Is that, oh, no, that's an F, not an M. Oh, I'm totally screwed. Oh, I just sent that email and I told somebody to F you instead of M you. That's not very good. It's going to cost me money. <laughs> and I, I figured, well, I, why not go this route? Just take the firmware screws out and it had an actually an M2 SSD, thankfully, which is why it, probably why it's so quick and nice. And I just upgraded that to a 128. It was a 32. But a lot of them come with 64 now. And if you have your own home server and you're just syncing files back and forth or you're, you're connecting via SFTP, you don't need a lot of storage on your machine. You just don't because you're going to run out anyway. You should put it on, you know, in the closet somewhere. We just end up hoarding data anyways, right? So you may as well hoard it in, hoard it in the right place. <laughs> yeah. Hoard it with your coats. <laughs> we know that you like you own a lot of coats. I know because your closet's so big. Are those coats hiding data? Um, but why the Chromebook and not like uh, one of the old like Lenovo laptops? Is it the size? Is it like wh what is it about supporting a big business like that? Because it feels... It's not the size. It was actually, um, well, a little bit of the size. <laughs> it always is, right? <laughs> it, it is. That's what I've been told. It's always the size. <laughs> I like the simplicity of it. Inside, there's just this little board. I don't even think there's a fan. And it's just, it's fairly light for the size. It's a 15 inch and it's just super simple. And um, it was also really expensive. I think it was like uh, just over 200 bucks. And it was pretty new at the time. I mean, it was like, I bought it refurbished. But it was pretty darn new at the time because people buy Chromebooks and they don't like them and then they send them back or whatever. And, you know, I get like tons of battery life in this thing because they're engineered for long battery life and it doesn't have more power than I need, hence giving up the battery life. So and also I had never done it. And I was like, 
oh, I need to flash one of these Chromebooks with core boot because right now I need to do the world a favor. There needs to be more core boot out there. Lockdown firmware is not okay. And it, it was partly an experiment for me. Once this thing gets long in the tooth, I'm seriously considering possibly System 76 something, but I need something that's quiet, like no fan and super thin. And so I'm, I don't know, sometimes maybe my standards... They get in the way of the right choice, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, and but that hits exactly one of the challenges that I see in the world these days is like, okay, we have things that are worth supporting, like Linux and all of those kind of things, but it, uh, it so often butts heads with the big sort of corporate giant out there, right? Also, you can't be talked into spending more than you think something is worth. It's a very difficult to do, and the only things that are cheap are the ones that are controlled by those corporate giants. Yeah, because of external, you know, some of the cost is externalized. Right. If you had a comparable price laptop to the XPS 13 and you knew you were going to have that uh, support and you knew that you were going to have all that stuff, which, again, System76 gets close to this. So, like I said, they might be, you know, but prior to that, you'd look at your Linux laptop choices and be like, what am I doing spending that on that, you know, for what, you know, and... It's funny how much that seems to be top of the list for some people. A, a, a lot of people. I'm not saying everyone because there's plenty of people who don't care. They just want to be, you know, have the freedom. But, uh, And that comes back to the question of why do we want Linux to be mainstream? You and I talked about this before. What is it that makes me want to not proselytize but share this with someone because I know it's good digital independence is good. And I likened it to like, it's a constitution. The GPL is like the way that we would run our country, right? In theory, it's the set of rules by which we run our digital country. And we're thinking, okay, it's, these are the rules. And if I can just, everybody plays by these rules, then everybody benefits. So I've got this really cool piece of software and I'm sharing it with you, not because it's cheap, not because it's free, but because it's gonna give you a little digital independence and if you're digitally independent and I'm digitally independent, the more of us that we are, we all benefit. It's not just because it's free. So it means not just money. It's not just the reason I know we share open source projects with each other. So that's what I was alluding to when I said that you feel like compelled to share this with people. And what's the reason for this compulsion for all these years? And it's the ability the ability to give someone else digital independence because you love them and you care about them and you care about the outcome for them and the rest of your fellow human beings. That's, that's why you're doing it. It's not because it's free. I, I, I'm not sure that's in the business model of some of these you know, more <laughs> capitalistic style <laughs> endeavors. <laughs> well, you have a lot of people who will say capitalism inherently is not bad it's the abuse of it that's bad, meaning the idea that we all have jobs and we can pay for our mortgages and our house and our car and send our kid to school because that's paid for, you know, partly with these commercial entities donating these beautiful computers to the schools. And I mean, there's like the capitalism has its way of giving back to you, too. But one of the things that open source software does and the, the constitution of open source land allows us to have is a check on greed. And that is a very unpopular thing to say, that I'm not socialist, I'm not capitalist, I'm not free market, I'm not anything. I think capitalism is great. It gives us innovation when there are laws against greed, when there are social contracts against greed, because there have to be limits. There are limits to the Earth's resources. There are limits to how much land a single human being needs. There are limits to how much water and how much electricity, and there are limits. And when you say, nope, our economy has no limits. You're just lying to yourself because it does have a limit. You're going to hit it and a lot of people are going to suffer. And there'll be a lot of suffering while you aren't because you're greedy. And that's not the kind of world I want to live in or my kids either. So I feel like that's one of the things that these open source licenses give us, a check on greed. And that's one of the reasons why I think we all like them because as soon as you start to be an abusive, greedy turd nugget, we can take the code and do something not greedy with it. Or there's only so much you can charge before you realize that you can't because anybody has the code. So it's that, that's all you need. You just need a check on greed. 
And, you know, patents ensure that that can't happen because you could be as greedy as you want for your EpiPen because no one else can make one. Mm-hmm. And we're past the point where patents are useful regardless of software or anything because to get us out of the challenges of climate change, we need to have a moratorium on all patents in building, you know, replacements for Portland cement, replacements for, you know, new energy. But we have this stupid mindset that patenting it will make people rush to make it. No, you're going to rush to make it because otherwise your kids are dead. You know, your kids' kids are going to be suffering majorly. That's why you're going to make it. You're going to make it because it's going to make the world a better place and save some lives and everything. But you're hampered. The speed of human knowledge sharing is hampered by the monopoly on that idea. We're, we're past. We, the internet made patents useless, basically, is what I'm trying to say out loud. Which is a good thing. And so how do you instill, like, massive innovation? Is it in that patent system or is it in the open source system? And I think we can all agree that... No, you, 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 got, you have it. That, that, well, open source generally doesn't have patents operating inside it. We join the Open Invention Network. We do everything we can just to make the patent trolls go away so we can build, so we can do things. Has open source come up with anything cool that commercial software hasn't? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. So what was the impetus for that then? To get your patent payoff? Did you need everybody to not build it while you were building it so that you could build it? What, what, well, then how was it possible? It was possible because that's what human endeavor is. It's discovering the unknown. It's creating what hasn't yet been created. It's building a better mousetrap. It's saying, oh, I did this more efficiently. Hey, see here, Brent? I actually have this on my house and it's super efficient. And then you go back to your house and you make your plumbing that way. That's what humanity has been doing for millennia and patents are just in the way now because anybody anywhere can share their knowledge. And you don't need a capital impetus to do that. You don't. You just need to want to save your child's life if you're a doctor to make up a new medicine or care about someone else besides yourself. You know, I read a very unfortunate stat recently of, you know, it's it's one of those stats that just gets worse every year of... Something insane like twenty the twenty four richest people in the world have more than like the lower three and a half billion or something like that. It's like, how did we even get here? And how is this serving anyone? It's not. It's not serving anyone but twenty four people. Well, it's serving twenty eight people. Yeah, twenty four. But it it's easy. There's just no limit to greed. And greed sounds like a you know, I'm not a religious person. I'm not at all. I'm an atheist. I made a documentary called The Unbelievers with Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss. I was the producer. I, it's not greed in the classical sense. It's just literally having more than you need and not just more than you need, but multiple, multiple millions of times more than any human needs. And like, I'm okay with things that would normally be greedy. Like if we just closed our eyes right now and said anyone in the world can make $500,000 a year, but no more. There's a whole bunch of people for which they'd be like, that is plenty of money. Oh man, what could I do with 500000 a year if I don't live in San Francisco? <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people who are like, that's just not enough. Well, those are the people that we have a problem. We have some kind of problem. And if I pegged that number to inflation and it just wrote out, you know, for the rest of the year, what would we do with all that extra money? You know, we'd have a great society. Why do you need that much more? Well, I need another house. I need ski trips. I need all this. Well, the reason that you need that is probably because you got the money to blow, maybe, or you're not feeling very philanthropic because you didn't really give anything away. I mean, you can live a great life for, I mean, what, 750000 then? We'll up it to that. A million dollars. That's the most you can make. One million dollars a year. Everybody listening to this right now. That's the most you can make. I put a cap at one million dollars. Are you going to be okay making a million dollars a year? Is anybody listening to this not going to be okay with that? If you are, you're in the incredible freaking minority. You are. And if I paid everybody listening to this a million dollars a year, we could do that with the amount of wealth that's squirreled away. Yeah. And still have extra I will have extra because your schools would be amazing then. Where else would the rest of the money in the economy go? It wouldn't disappear. It'd still be there. We'd have amazing schools. You'd have plenty of money left over because there'd be no reason to keep it. <laughs> Here on this, this Linux podcast today is about greed. It's about greed. You know, 
Those goddamn closed source licenses. Those greedy bastards and their patents. Anyway, Linux. Well, listeners, we're going to take a tiny break here for now, so stay tuned for part two coming this Friday. That's only three days away from more of my great conversation with Jason Spizak. We'll see you on the other side. 